going to talk about my mission that I started about 20 years ago to make Hannah Frank a household name in her lifetime and then onwards. And then I'm going to bring Jean and Sylvie in, who have taken, who are part of a team of, Glas of fabulous young Glasgow University students, who are pretty much her contemporaries in a funny way. My aunt was a young Glasgow University student in her 20s when she did the main body of her <coughs> young Glasgow University students in their 20s who have taken on the um, taken on this project. So I'm very excited to be working with them. Um, so I'm going to try and start off with the film. We'll see how that goes. I'm nearly 100. I always remember that. Sunday the 27th of December, 1925, wrote the no, following. No picture, Fiona. They laughed, oh, and Misty oh, no. faded into the Elfland, and a fairy song came floating to that veil beneath. A fairy song that weeping, laughed, and laughing wept. They were gone. And I sighed in the valley, in the lone dark valley of shadows, for the fairy folk at play. Yearning, I thought of the Elfland and the fairy roundelay. The air was filled with a nebulous waving and voices as of the falling leaves or slow, gliding water. I dreamt of forms that came from the violet shadows, cloudy, silvery gleaming, of pale, cold faces, pale with the moon's ray, the fleeting touch of cold, cold hands, of happenings passing strange. I awoke. I was come from the Elfland, from a land of voices and shadows. Sighing, uprising, I went from the valley. began working as an artist in the 1920s and she carried on into the beginning of this century when she was in her 90s. Her critically acclaimed sculptures and pictures are still being exhibited around the country. Some are also on show in the Glasgow Care Home where she's lived since 2002. Judy Herman went to meet Hannah there in the company of her niece, Fiona Frank. She's editing the diaries her aunt wrote almost daily as a young woman growing up in the artistic community of interwar Glasgow. Uh, Wednesday the 10th of July 1929 a letter from Sydney Needoff accompanying the reproductions of my drawings that I had asked him for, thanking me for the poems, which would surely feature in the first issue. I had the spark divine. In tall trees shade and fairy, and strange wild music played, piercing the ear with sweetest sound, so that I trembled. Dimly lit a train moved from the forest steps. They were gone. I heard the music still, faintly, wafted faintly, till it died in the forest steps. That's a nice poem, isn't it? I stayed me there. You don't have to see much to start me off in that one. I know. I stayed me there in tall tree shade and fairy. F-A-E-R-Y. I just wanted to bring Auntie Hannah into the picture before I started talking about her so that um, some of you have seen the films and uh, some of you will get a chance to see the film. So Lynn and I um, grew up with the art pretty much. My dad had um, the, a set of sign prints in the surgery when we were growing up. We were doctor's children, the surgery was part of the house and the, paint, and the drawing, the framed prints were all the way round the outside of the um, were all the way round the outside of the walls in the waiting room, and they all had the names of the prints underneath, except for one of them, which was called "Come Lovely and Soothing Death," 
and we didn't have that one. Um, he cut the name of that one off because it really wasn't the right picture to have in a doctor's waiting room. Um, when it was just like they were like part of my family, those drawings. I just was, they were familiar objects. And so when I left home, I took three or four, of, three or four frame prints with me and had them up in every single flat, that, flat share and flat and house that I ever lived in. And most people would just go past them. But I don't know, one in a one in hundred of my friends, when they came to the house, would get completely transfixed by the drawings. They were like, they, would, they were like magnets for certain people. And so years later, when I was going through my aunt's correspondence, I'd find letters from different ones of my friends from every single bit of my life asking to buy prints because the ones that got transfixed would write to my aunt and, she, and Auntie Hannah would write back lovely letters and send prints, which used to cost about five shillings in those days and don't now. Um, when my aunt, when um, Auntie Hannah and Uncle Arnold were moving into West Acres, you saw um, that thing at the beginning of the film was um, was her was Auntie Hannah in West Acres at the end of her life. When they were moving into a care homes, they looked at a few care homes, and they realised that they weren't going to be able to keep all their stuff, which was they had a house absolutely rammed to the rafters well literally because her studio was in the attic um or she had a load of stuff in the attic the studio was in one of the bedrooms um she had this house full of paint of drawings and pictures and sculptures and stuff like that and so she asked me if i could help to disperse the work um hold on this oh no that's that's the window cleaner i don't need to go and do anything again. um <laughs> that's the problem with working at home you get uh, you get interruptions while you're doing presentations hilarious um so she asked me to help to disperse the work before they were moving into an old people's home and a care home. And I felt it was wrong to just disperse it. And I, would, I got in touch with various family members to say, would they take this sculpture and that sculpture? And it just seemed peculiar. And I went to see the Peter Scott Gallery, which was my local gallery at Lancaster University where I was working. And they suddenly started squeaking and went absolutely, went, got really excited and came up to meet Auntie Hannah and they put an exhibition on at the end of the year. It was, I think it was February when I went to see them and the exhibition was in September before they moved into the home. And they never do that, you know, galleries have five year schedules, but they got so excited about this work, they felt it was really important and that it needed to be exhibited before it was dispersed. And in the end, the work was never dispersed because they moved into West Acres, which was the most amazing old people's home, a care home, that happened to have purpose-built, well, they weren't purpose-built, but they looked purpose-built alcoves that when you see the film, you'll see, where the sculptures just fit and still fit 10 years after her death. The sculptures are still in, the old, in, in West Acres, where they treat them with love and care and attention. Um, so... All the, I nev we never had to have the auction, we never had to have the um, di giving the work piecemeal around the family and all the work was kept together as were her papers and letters and so on. Um, during the time that she was in West Acres, I decided that I would um, dedicate myself to making her a household name in her lifetime and I spent a bit of time after the Peter Scott exhibition trying to make, because they got so excited in the work, I thought, oh, okay, so this is definitely, my aunt's a proper artist. She's not just like my auntie that draws nicely, but she's actually a proper artist that, that can have a proper exhibition in a gallery. So I started getting more interested in it. I went and did a course in art appreciation so that I could speak to other artists because I didn't know what I was talking about. And that really helped just to get vocabulary. And then there were the treacle years. So I think I spent four years knocking on doors and wading through treacle and nothing happened and I couldn't work out what I was doing wrong because I knew it was the right thing to do this mission and that the Peter Scott Gallery had given me the confidence and we also had this beautiful book um, which was which was made um, no that actually the book hadn't been made by that time they had there was a book that my uncle had made but between Peter Scott Gallery in 2001 and Plankton Peter Scott Gallery in 2000, 
so the, there was that book that my uncle had made that my sister's showing at the moment. I shall spotlight, uh, Jean spotlighting her. Um, thank you. So that book could be made by my uncle for her, but there was nothing else particularly. But I knew I was doing the right thing. So I just carried on knocking on doors and eventually, suddenly, um, eventually, suddenly, um, hang on, how can I make myself? There you go. Um, eventually, the first thing happened, which was that Lancaster City Council Museum decided they'd do an exhibition. And then they put loads of resources into it and they made this beautiful book. Um, well, they helped me to make this beautiful book and we launched it at that exhibition. They did some fantastic exhibition panels. And at the same time, I made contact with Glasgow University, who were willing, that was 2004, and then they were willing in 2008 to do a centenary exhibition. So I had a five year plan. It was very exciting. We, were, we spent four years planning that centenary exhibition and I had a four year plan to take the work all around the world. We met, I met this fabulous woman in, who ran a, a gallery in Boston who decided she was going to pay for the works to get over to America. Um, and then we had this whirlwind of the four years taking the work round all over Scotland, a couple of dates in England and three places in America while, we were, while it was at Boston. So I kind of achieved, I think I achieved the thing. The 100th birthday exhibition in 2008 was attended by Miriam Margulies and, um, and I've completely forgotten his name, her, my aunt's MP, who shared a birthday, um, used to be leader of Scottish Labour, and I can't remember his name, but he... Jim him. Murphy. Thank you very much. Jim Murphy um, and Miriam Margulies, I don't know which is, um, which, which gets the best points for being, you know, celebrity that you want at your exhibition. It was opened by the Minister for Culture at the time, um, Linda Fabiani, just a fabulous exhibition. And the, so hands up who was there at that opening. Um, the, we wheeled Auntie Hannah in, she hadn't wanted to go. She, um, the, um, somebody gave her a presentation. Um, what's the name of the fabulous sculptor that made the horses? in the, what, um, the horses, the Kelpies and the... Andy Scott. Andy, Andy Scott, Scott yes. Andy Scott was there and Andy Scott made her this presentation and she was very excited when she opened the packet um, and she said, and, then, and it was a picture of his horses and she said, oh, I thought it was going to be chocolate. Um, but we had, it was a fabulous day and we showed the film. Um, it was the, the beginning, the, the first showing of the film. And so we opened her 100th birthday exhibition. She died later on that year and her death was announced on BBC Radio Scotland. So I think that I did my thing to make Auntie Hannah a household name in her lifetime. If you're deaf, if, I think I did that achievement because of the death being announced on BBC Radio Scotland. I think I got my thing. When I started off at the beginning of the project and I was thinking about what it would look like, I would want, I'd want to be on, the, I'd want to be on the radio, which we managed to do. I'd want to be on, um, I'd want there to be a colour supplement article about her, which we did. I'd want exhibitions all around the world, which we did. I think we got there. And I'm really proud of what I managed to do. Um, I need to say at this point that when my mum married my dad, um, she was a lot younger than my dad. And my dad had lived in this big house in Preston for a number of years before my mum joined him in 1948. And so my mum was a 21 year old young person from London, moved up to Preston. And there were all my aunt's drawings all the way around the house. And my mum's memories were of these weird things staring down at her from the walls and creeping her out. I don't think she said creeping her out, but that was the expression, that was the sentiment. And she made my dad put the drawings in the garage. And so they were the originals. Exactly. So then, um, but next time Auntie Hannah came down to Preston, she said, Leo, where are my drawings? And 
he said, well, I'm afraid Phyllis made me put them in the garage. So she was absolutely furious, took them all back to Glasgow, exhibited them. They became really well known. And then every, and, the, and so it was said that every student in Glasgow had a Hannah Frank on their walls and she became really well known and, and the story goes on and they were exhibited for the next um, how many years. And my mum always said that if she'd have liked the drawings in the first place, Auntie Hannah would never have become famous. So it's all down to her. Um, so there you go. And of course, later on, at the end of my, at the end of our mum's life, she had all the drawings exhibited in her um, on the walls in her flat. But of course, we couldn't get the originals back. That was just the print. Ah, um, so here we. That's that's a um, a quick story of the fifteen years that I did leading up to the hundredth birthday. And then we had a few exhibitions between two thousand and eight, um, after she died, and. Um, 2016 and then in about 2000 and, and we had a poetry competition, um, kept selling prints, a few more things. Every, every few months something new would happen, like somebody would put it on the front, put one of her drawings on the front cover or it was in, in a liberal synagogue um, book or all sorts of different things. And then in 2017 it struck me well, it struck me because I, I found out about somebody else that was born in 2000, in the same time as Auntie Hannah, who was having coming up to their 110th birthday. And I thought, oh, we could have a 110th birthday. So I went to Glasgow University and said, do you fancy doing a 110th birthday exhibition for um, Auntie Hannah 10 years on? And I met all exactly the same people 10 years on, and it was like being in a time warp. Everybody sort of looked the same and not the same and we were just having the same conversation 10 years later. And I went to, I was told about Glasgow University Internship Hub and Glasgow University Internship Hub allows you to build relationships with fabulous young Glasgow University students who need a little bit of life experience and um, you can have them free or you can try and get money for them. So I went along and I said, well, I wouldn't mind a couple and I ended up with five wonderful students. And eventually I managed to get £7,000 from um, Creative Scotland. So not only did I have these students, but also I was able to pay them. And Sylvie and Jean, who are two of these students, are going to take over from me and tell the rest of the story. Sylvie, could you share the slides? Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about basically what happened before the exhibition opened, how we went about planning it. And then Sylvia is going to focus on the outreach program we came with and the events we organized around the exhibition. So, um, first slide, please. Sorry, I'll have to <laughs> do this all the time. So this was our first meeting in September 2018. Uh, this was two months before the exhibition opened. And at this stage, we got to uh, basically got to know each other, but we were planning marketing, we were brainstorming, uh, what could we do, what we could do for our outreach program, the communities we would like to reach, how we could best reach them. Um, next slide, please. Then we, a big thing was to go to West Acres where the collection was stored and it looked something like this. Everything was really wrapped up and uh, we um, kind of went there and unpacked everything. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. We uh, unpacked everything. We went there a couple of times and we took a good look at what was available and, it, and at what we could work with. And Fiona had her own works as well. So we took de decisions on what to prioritize. For example, we wanted to include uh, as many originals as possible, but we also wanted to have our own favorite works and obviously works that would make sense uh, for the curatorial concept we came up with. And I will talk to you about, uh, um, about it a bit later. And another thing we had in mind was to have works that could help us organize outreach events. So we thought about what, what could be the best works to work with children, for example, or the best works that we can use to arrange activities um, and creative creative activities around them. So um, 
then it's really interesting to see that we've done the hanging and the cleaning ourselves, which was really fun for us, I think. So on the right, you can see uh, how we drilled holes in the frames. And on the left, there's Sylvie cleaning uh, one of the frames. So that was, part of the, that was part of that as well. And it was a really good experience. And then uh, this is a picture we took when we hung the exhibition. So we did the hanging inside the um, Glasgow University Memorial Chapel. And um, we also, uh, I included this slide to point out that when we were doing the marketing, uh, we had um, materials designed for the exhibition. So I did, this is the poster I designed. And we also had invitations, postcards, leaflets, and other exhibition materials like labels and exhibition panels. And uh, we split up in teams and we went around Glasgow and Edinburgh and uh, distributed posters and materials. And we did a social media campaign and things like that. And then this led up to the exhibition opening. And uh, there's a little video I took then. Yeah, so it was very well attended. There was music that Piona arranged and a kosher buffet and uh, a shop where we were selling uh, the book and print. And uh, Alice Strang came to speak. Uh, she's the senior uh, curator at Scotland. She's a senior curator at uh, the Scottish National Galleries. And she spoke about Hannah Frank's place in the world of Scottish art. Uh, and she had first became aware of Hannah's work while curating an exhibition to celebrate the achievements of Scottish women artists. Uh, and these are a couple of uh, pictures we took uh, at the uh, opening. Uh, Ellie String was the woman in the in the blue top. Uh, and now finally, I'm going to talk a bit more about the exhibition. So how we decided to organize the works, what was our thinking when it came to when it came to her art, and I'm also going to talk a bit about her art as well. So uh, the first section in the first section, we wanted to have uh, a bit about her as a person and her life. Uh, so um, I hope you can see that we included some personal photos. Uh, the first one uh, was a picture of her as a child with her family. Uh, then there's a picture of uh, her at her wedding and then a picture of her as an artist. On the other side, there was a picture of her as a student as well. Uh, we included um, a sculpture of Charles Frank, her father uh, in this section. And you can see in the blue picture, there it was we included a photograph of a, uh, of charles frank's um shop in salt market then we had a bit of uh, we had a small section on her early work uh, which uh i think was my favorite um so this we kind of thought about this section as starting from uh, 1925 to 1928 so only three years but the first uh, work you can see on the left is the very first work she made. And the one you can see on the right is my favorite work, which I spoke about in the past. Um, so some of you who are here in the past, you, you, you might have heard me talking about that. But what to point out here is the use of intricate details and patterns. The, these works are more detailed than the later works. And they have a strong narrative dimension because the works are based on poems she wrote herself or by po by poems written by a poet such as Coleridge and Keats. Um, the second uh, section was what we thought what we thought were the most representative of her style. So um, here the lines become simple and elongated. The, she uses more organic forms rather than geometrical patterns. Uh, they are darker as well. And uh, we included the work Flight, um, which was made during the war, for example. And uh, it, uh, we talked about how during the war, um, her drawings became darker. Flight was linked to uh, the plight of Jews escaping from the Nazis to the exod Exodus. And um, the, in the third, yeah, sure. Uh, just a sec, can you go back to that one? I just wanted to point out that this week is um, Refugee Week. And this is when 
I think when the um, United Nations started off thinking about refugee, the plight of refugees, and that's a picture which really epitomizes it. And so, it was one of the reasons why we decided to have it in the first place, because we, we thought it would be a good idea to kind of organize activities with uh, refugee groups um, mm -hmm. around that work and talk about it and things like that. And that, and that happened. Although it does, it did turn out that refugees get really fed up talking about the refugee experience all the time and they just want to do art. They don't necessarily need to do art about being a refugee. We learned quite quickly. Back to you. Okay, and um, in the last part, we uh, noticed the shift um, where the works are more filled with light and sunshine rather than the stark black uh, from before. So now there's a lot of white as the dominant color and the compositions are more dynamic and playful as well, rather than the static figures from before. Uh, we also included some sculptures. Uh, she had attended sculpture classes from 1952, initially to help her drawing skills, but then sculpture became her main medium. Uh, we had six, sculpt six sculptures plus uh, the Charles Frank sculpture, and I think one more, but these, these were kind of um, yeah, arranged in the back. Um, and she, oh, another thing to note is that she studied under Benno Schultz at Glasgow School of Art and uh, Benno Schultz is a figure we also heard before in the, in the club. So it's a nice connection to make. And finally, we decided to have a section on the creative process, which is, uh, which was in a way unusual because when we saw the um, rubber mold, you can see as the first picture on the slide, uh, Fiona didn't think it would be something that would interest us because it wasn't, yeah, it, it, it's not as pretty maybe, but to us it was really interesting to kind of try and trace the way she, she worked with her materials and how the works came to be. So we thought that maybe it would be of interest to other people and other students like us to um, do a bit on the creative process and learn about how the works came to look like they look like in, fi in final form. So the creative process section reveals the casting method used for her sculptures. And we had a panel on uh, how she worked with bronzes and things like that. And we had the mold that you could touch as well, which was nice, as well as um, the steps she went through to create her drawings and prints. So in the middle picture, we had we basically had, um, yeah, we tried to showcase the stages she went through when designing her prints. And th these were original drawings. And then we had the final product, uh, towards the end. And we also had uh, the metal uh, print plates that were used and those were also nice because you could touch as well and children like that and we used them for activities too. Um, do I have a final slide? Oh, that, that's, that's it for me. So okay. now Sylvie is going to talk about... Can you go back to the, that one? So the other thing about the printing plates is that we started thinking about accessibility quite early on and we were... And the printing plates is like a a touch representation of the work so you can actually touch you can feel the work and we we reached out to blind groups which Sylvie's going to talk a little bit more about. Back to you. Okay. What was so you I'm about? I'm gonna talk about the outreach that we did with the exhibition which was a really a large part of what we did um, and it was really key to how we planned the exhibition we wanted to reach as many people as possible so there were kind of three main ways that we did this. Um, the first was by offering tours. So we would have tours around the university and Glasgow, which focused on Hannah Frank and kind of set her within her wider context. Um, so an example of this might have been a tour run, which was Hannah Frank's Glasgow University. So these were open to the public and anyone could join. Um, and they were really great for just teaching people more about Hannah as a person. And then about the art and the exhibition, we had free weekly tours and um, these are normally run by Fiona. And I think they were just a really great way for people to truly interact with the exhibition because you've got somebody so personal guiding you through and people really, um, really liked those. And the second main way that we were doing our outreach was through talks. So we did have a program of talks running throughout um, the exhibition I think we actually had four talks in January so one every week and these were on like a really really wide range um, 
we would invite specialists in for example we invited uh, powder hall bronze foundry from edinburgh to come and talk about how you create sculptures and like the history of sculptures and then we also had um a showing of the spark divine which was the film that we just so we had a showing of that and we had a talk from the director and uh, the director sarah thomas for that and that was really great as well for people to interact um, with Hannah and with her wider context. I think that was something really important when we curated the exhibition was we didn't just want to show her work. We really wanted to teach people more about Hannah and to make it a more personal experience. Um, and the really key way we continued our outreach throughout was uh, these workshops. So there were all different types of workshops. There were open workshops. Um, so we had a couple of different types. The first was workshops organized by each intern. So an intern would choose an artwork that really uh, resonated with them. And then they would create a workshop around that particular artwork. And we were always kind of focusing on creative responses because we wanted to understand how people personally felt about the artwork. And that's what we were really interested in seeing. And um, we covered loads of different Oh. oh, she's frozen. She'll come back. Come back, Sylvie. Hold on. Hello. Can you hear me? We can now, yes. Okay, cool. What did I drop out? Where did I drop out? Lots of different workshops, such and then Go on to the workshops like um, Myra. No? Go back to the workshop with Myra. Okay, I'll go to the workshop with Myra. So then the other part of our open workshops um, were when we would invite specialists in and they would run a workshop relating to their specialism and also relating to Hannah Frank. Um, so one of these, for example, was one, by, one run by textile artist Myra Ostakini, who ran an amazing workshop where people could embroider uh, Hannah Frank prints with thread and bright colours or just even with silver and we also worked with Myra to create a sculpture that was completely wrapped in thread and it was amazing I don't have a picture of it but maybe we can try and find one to send around because it was really amazing talk a little bit about the school's work as well yeah so then we're going into our private workshop so these were ones that were organised uh, with, by the interns directly with an organisation um, so we covered groups such as schools, uh, workshops for the visually impaired and also community groups. And um, so this was something that we pinpointed right at the beginning that we wanted to do. Uh, and each intern kind of had a different area that they would specialize in. So someone organized all the school workshops, for example. And the school workshops were huge, <laughs> you know, 25, some, sometimes 25 kids. And I think we ran four or five. So we reached about 100 plus 100 plus kids in the local area and it was so amazing to see how they connected in such a different way to the adults i just i think hannah was so imaginative and she has that childlike imagination and even though the subjects of the works are quite dark sometimes the kids really resonated with it um and they would say things you would never expect um, so each, for each of these different types of workshops, we had to tailor them quite differently because obviously for school kids, I think they were around 12, if I remember correctly, 11, 12. So they needed a lot of different activities. We couldn't just expect them to sit down and really uh, focus for two hours on one work, for example. So we would offer a whole range of different activities, get them working in groups, get them talking about the art, we did a tour, so we involved Hannah as, in there as well. Whereas for something like workshops for the visually impaired, where we worked with groups like the Scottish War Blinded, um, we needed to have more structure. And obviously we needed to have some tools to help us connect everyone to the art. So we had these amazing kind of microscope screens, which would zoom in. And we obviously had the printing plates, which are textured. So they're like a metal texture and it was amazing to see people interacting with the artwork through touch. Um, and then for community groups, we had loads of different people coming in. We had craft cafes. 
we worked with big arts organizations like Impact Arts um, to just bring Hannah's work to everyone. And these are really, for many, many weeks throughout the exhibition, we were running different types of workshops. Um, and finally, um, the evaluation event. So in the evaluation event, we wanted to discuss everything about the exhibition. So this is going from right at the beginning of curation to right at the end with all of the outreach that we did. So we invited tons of different people. We invited people who had just come by the exhibition and had enjoyed it or were interested in it. We invited um, individuals from organisations who we had been working with, such as Impact Arts and Scottish War Blinded. And we also um, invited people who had attended workshops or tours or talks, just because we wanted a wide array of responses because we were really looking for an exhibition which would connect with a large group of people. So then we all, all the interns and Fiona was there as well. We sat down with different groups um, made up of different sorts of people and we discussed various aspects of the exhibition, including accessibility, curation, outreach, future events, and also the archiving and safekeeping of Hannah's work. So we wanted to hear feedback from the audience. How had they found these aspects of the exhibition and we also wanted suggestions for the future. So we had a lot of suggestions for future projects, including a Hannah Frank exhibition alongside her contemporaries, um, responses with dance and poetry, and even taking Hannah's work to a more contemporary space. Um, and we also had a lot of other great feedback, which included that, um, for example, somebody coming from the Scottish War Blinded spoke about how great the ac accessibility of the exhibition was which was really important for us um, so that was really really nice and we had a lot of people saying how they loved the personal touches you know the biography section and the other really popular aspects of the exhibition was the process section because I think that's something that's often just ignored and it's always a finished product but when it's something like a pen and ink drawing or a sculpture which has quite a complex um, process. It's very interesting for people to see that and understand it. Yep. So that was the outreach and the final evaluation event. Okay. And this is, so this is my bit, um, which is basically, what do we do next? I've called my interns back together again after, um, after six months when we haven't been together. During that time that they were together, we had enough funding from Creative Scotland to do a fantastic piece of work, which was um, beginning to, to catalogue, beginning to improve the website, beginning to catalogue all of the works because we had to find out where everything is. We're not, there's a few works that are lost, but there's quite a few works that we vaguely know where they were, but the information isn't all in one place. So. One of the interns, Lilith, who's not available today, is fantastic at, at detail. Um, we've, um, Sylvie and one of the other interns, Lisa, have been doing audio descriptions of all of the works. So if you go back a bit and show my mate Ed again, click back three, two. So there, um, right at the very beginning, I was, when I first interviewed my interns, um, I was staying on my friend Ed's goat farm in Cape Clear Island in Ireland and Ed is a blind goat farmer who loves art and they decided that they needed, they were interested in accessibility in art but they couldn't understand it and they were a bit frightened of blind people because they hadn't met one and so I got Ed, that's Ed Skyping with them in Scotland, um, telling, talking to them about how a blind person might possibly access art. And Lisa, one of the other interns, took, took on the cause of, blind, of, of accessibility for blind people. And she and I went to meet one of the blind, um, I can't remember what it's called, Visibility Scotland or something group in Glasgow. And they talked to us about what they might want about an accessible exhibition. So it's not Braille signs, hardly any people don't they tend to read Braille now, it's bigger signs, it's people meeting you off the bus stop if necessary to come to one of the talks, making, getting a personal touch, getting, being able to come and touch things. So we were very happy that we had sculptures as well as, as 
to that drawing. We were very so happy that we had the um, metal plate, printing plates, as well as the drawings. It meant that there was a lot of tactile stuff in this exhibition. One of the things that we talked about doing but never did was, I'm going to the last slide now, one of the things that we talked about doing but never did was visual representations of the drawings, so like um, actors being the drawings, you know, Sylvie and Lisa have lovely long hair and I always had this image that you might put on B Moon Ballet, you know, you two and some, another friend of yours with hair and long cloaks or something like that, that people could come and touch you, I know, that, that never happened, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Um, so, carry on, so the next, so the last slide please. So, what I'm hoping, um, what this lovely Scottish Jewish Art Club has been doing over the weeks is discussing and being critical and constructive. And so I'd really love to have some, just some feedback on what we've been talking about and some nice appreciation for our, for our work and for Auntie Hannah's art and for my fabulous, wonderful students and the amazing work that they did. But also, over the lockdown period, it struck me that we don't need to be limited by space anymore. And so at the end of last year, we spent a bit of time knocking on gallery doors, trying to find a space. But spaces are incredibly limiting and there is no limits anymore. Um, there are no limits. And the next exhibition could be an international exhibition where everybody can see it all over the world. I've already got a woman in Los Angeles who has run a class in how to do creative responses to Hannah Frank's work to a thousand different art teachers all over Los Angeles. You know, there's no, there's no boundaries anymore. So I've got, this, I've got this vision of an international digital exhibition with a speaker every week that could be joined by people all over the world. We've already got people all over the world just here. We've got an Aust Australians here. It's amazing. Worldwide creative responses, we don't have to just stick to, to art. There can be drama and I'll read this dance and music. We've already had a poetry competition. We've had creative writing about Hannah Frank's art. We've had, Sylvie did some, Sylvie and Louis and Lisa did some fantastic schools work where they did poetry. Um, dance is another thing where this work is so fluid. There's so much dancing in it already. I just haven't ever commissioned a dance response to Hannah Frank's art, but I've just got this idea of all kinds of things that we could do next. And I'm, um, next week the, are the interviews for my job, basically. So I will be free and retired from October. And I do tend, tend, intend to take some time actually off. But I've also got, um, I think I've got another year or so in me to try and do a big creative responses international exhibition before the most amazing thing happens, which is that before lockdown, I went to see Alice Strang at the National Galleries to find out what it is that the nieces of famous artists from the last century did a hundred years ago to make sure that their relatives' works are on the walls in the National Gallery now. And what I was told is you have to get the works into the national collections. You can't just store them in an old people's home. And so um, the Scottish National Galleries have agreed to take the works on paper. And um, so I don't want to give them up yet because I want to do another exhibition and then do it. But I do like the idea of an international exhibition. So basically, I'm going to throw it open to you. Um, for some ideas, comments, talks, appreciations, thank yous, memories, anything really. <laughs>